Kia ora tato, welcome. It's 5.30, so we'll get underway. Dealing to climate risk. Last year was the hottest year on record. And this year, global heating is expected to pass the 1.5 degree limit that's been targeted as a maximum. So in this Fabian session, we're going to look at the risks we are facing from the climate crisis and how we start to deal with them. I should start with the risk for this country that was announced yesterday, losing the leadership of James Shaw for the Green Party and for the country. His work as Minister of Climate Change has seen the establishment of the Climate Commission and the passing of the Zero Carbon Act. And his winning of bipartisan support have seen both of these remain unchanged by the change in government. So he will be, so far, his expertise, his leadership is going to be missed, I think. But moving on, let's start with risk at local government level and go to our first speaker, Sophie Hanford. First of all, congratulations, Sophie, winning the Prime Minister's Award. Uh, Sophie's off to Japan for a couple of months uh, to look at sustainable communities, decarbonising communities. Back in 2019, Sophie founded School Strike for Climate, which mobilised something like 170,000 people across the country. But Sophie wasn't content with this. She wanted to get into the system and get stuff done. So she's now in her second term as Kapiti Councillor. And this district council is already wrestling with rising sea levels, the implications for properties along Waikanae and along the coast. In fact, I think the council got taken to court some years back for trying to write it on people's limb reports that they were at risk. So, Sophie, local bodies, the risk. Sure. Kia ora, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and especially on what is a beautiful evening out and about, being inside and listening t to this conversation and hopefully being a part of it and in indulging us with your questions. Uh, we're really looking forward to as well. So I'll probably just give a super brief overview kind of from a local government perspective and yeah, really keen to hear to hear that of, of others uh, as part of this conversation as well. So as as was mentioned, obviously the, the implications of a rising sea and the fact that we now have more severe and intense weather events more frequently is very much a real um, problem that we're not only going to be facing in the future in Kapiti, but is very much a, a threat right now uh, and something that also is imposing kind of quite a bit of fear onto our community. So I think there's also a, a sort of social risk that comes with the risk that our infrastructure uh, is facing in the form of seawalls that we do or don't have uh, in some, some parts of our coast. So there is kind of that physical risk to um, to households and to homes and also the the um, yeah the sort of almost civil risk that comes with the way in which we find or the way that we find us ourselves sorry the way through that we find uh, to that to that crisis with with some believing that council should play a role in the protection of private property others believing that it's a bigger conversation about the potential of managed retreat um, there's also conversations about you know how long we leave the community where it is before we essentially say, well, if, if we were to truly rebalance our relationship with nature, um, maybe that looks like just sort of taking a step back and letting it do its thing. Um, but those are all conversations that we need to have, which involve quite a bit of almost psychosocial risk. Um, and people in our community are, are kind of very much feeling the heat of, so to speak, um, because it's obviously quite a personal uh, and an intimate conversation when you're talking about where someone's growing up, um, where they've created so many memories and the place that they love. So that's also, I think, a bit of a risk is how we keep our communities together um, through what are some tough conversations that need to be had. Um, but yeah, we, we really do need to, to start to move forward on because it's only going to get harder the longer that we leave it. There's also some real risks, I think, at the moment that we're experiencing locally in terms of people's well-being and the fear uh, in which people are feeling when they look at the global state of play with the climate and even in New Zealand, the fact that we continue to have our hottest summers on record, the fact that um, this year, for example, will be the world's biggest ever year of democracy where over half of the world's population will vote in some form of an election. And so to think about the fact that so much this year could either change for the better 
or potentially what would be m the most likely scenario is just the peddling of business as usual, which we know uh, is meaning that the planet that we rely on for our own collective survival is, is really at risk. So there's a lot of people in our community who are feeling quite fearful about the global state of play and then how we locally also contribute to that. I think there's also a risk uh, that's maybe a perceived one that we are changing too quickly or we're being too aspirational with the way in which we frame up our climate action. So in Carpeti, we've just committed uh, to striving for carbon neutrality as a district by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of the rest of Aotearoa New Zealand. We just last year signed off on a plan change to build 15, well, to, to enable 15 stories around our um, main metropolitan centre, the Parapara Umu train station. Currently the tallest building in that zone is just three stories, so there is some massive change that's coming, both hopefully to benefit people and planet, but I think there's also a risk that um, the politicians who are championing that change and who are trying their very best to be transformational in their actions and, and take that ambition forward will be voted out because it's not the popular thing to do, even though it's crucially important uh, and, it's, and it needs to happen now. So there is that risk too, I think, around how we make sure that our local government politicians who are, who are trying to do tangible... Um, tangible on the ground things to kind of densify our communities and to make them more walkable and spend on things that reduce emissions are able to, to, to maintain in, in those positions doing that work and I feel grateful um, to be continuing to do that. There's also a risk in local government I think that we, we don't factor in the cost of inaction. So often in our long-term planning we're talking about okay well we can't we can't raise rates too high. Um, the, the percentage rates increase that we put forward to the community must be palatable because you know the cost must be affordable, it must be able to be confronted by our community members in that moment, but also the cost of inaction, the longer we leave it, will only get harder to bear for both those who live in our communities now but also the next generation. So I think if we don't start to factor that in and start to seriously think about, about how we do that, um, local government is, yeah, has a serious risk in terms of how it operates its balance books and continues to provide the infrastructure that our communities um, desperately need. So, yeah, that's, I guess, where my head's at in terms of local government risk. Oh, just w just a one follow-up question, Sophie, for you. Um, in terms of um, how long, what's the time frame for the first line of coastal properties disappearing so yeah it's a it's a very sensitive subject for us at the moment in Carpeti. we we currently are um at council has sort of set up and are facilitating this project or process called takutai Carpeti. so it's a community-led coastal adaptation process so we've got a team of people called the cap they're a panel of people um ably led by right honorable jim bolger who's a resident of Carpeti. And they've been working over the last two to three years on um, sort of corralling the community, hearing from the community as to, to the ways in which they think um, they should be adapting to the climate crisis, whether they should be um, putting up hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure, whether retreat comes into the conversation and at what kind of stage that happens, but mainly focused around different triggers. So when the water reaches a certain level, then what happens? So it's not necessarily focused on time frames, but more so triggers. Right. Uh, and those recommendations will be coming back to council in June of this year. And then council will make a decision uh, about the, the various adaptation areas of the district uh, and yeah, how much is spent and when uh, on putting in place those measures. Yeah. And, uh, and is council and our homeowners facing insurance issues already? Are some homes becoming uninsurable? So something that we're often sort of a criticism that council's often faced with is well okay yep you can commission all of this the science which is very much real by or from from places like jacobs and you can you can get this but we're really worried about the fact that um if you're holding the science on your on your records and it's something that you know you're working with as a council what will that mean for our insurance but we very much think that 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 insurance picture is playing out as we speak and that council um, continuing to be very up to date with the science, which is ever changing and, and ever sort of worsening in the um, in terms of the the 
yeah, the realities of the crisis and how quickly we're likely to continue seeing change in terms of our coastline, um, that insurance picture is is definitely relevant to to council, but it's something that yeah homeowners are facing regardless of what council does um, in the face of of a changing climate and its impact on our coast. But yeah, it's something that um, the community is definitely aware of, and that we yeah as I guess leaders of our community are, are acutely aware of as well. Um, and and we're yeah th there are sort of there are discussions that are uh, happening in that space too. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Rutger Kaiser is a senior leader in the management of climate related risks and he's recently done a master's in strategic studies and which focused on disaster management. Rutger, your experience is working in infrastructure. Tell us about the, the climate risks that you see ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Um, it's very good to see so many of you here. I can't see those online, but uh, I think someone might uh, give us the numbers later. Mm. Very happy because it's a topic that uh, impacts us all. Now, climate change is uh, everywhere, and a lot of people talk about climate risk in very kind of generic terms. So what is a climate risk? We all know the world is heading for one and a half degree degrees and we're doing everything we can to try and stop that from happening. But we also know that last year uh, we've already surpassed one and a half degrees. And at some point, Bill McKibben wrote about that late last year, we actually at some point even uh, trespassed two degrees. Now that's only a temporary thing and we went back, so the average isn't there. But it's certainly a worrying sign. Now. When we talk about climate risk, if for New Zealand, you think like of all these things, you see pictures of large floods around the equator. We have had our share. We've had the Auckland floodings exactly a year ago. We've had Cyclone Gabriel almost a year ago. And I mean, apart from the hardship that caused and the fact that people's livelihoods and homes were destroyed, it caused the damage of $14 billion and still counting. So just to put it in perspective, the total GDP of New Zealand economy is just over $400 billion. So $14 billion is 3.5%. That is amazing. Of course, the bad thing about GDP is the fact that actually uh, they like these things because those $14 billion adds to the GDP, which is a bit <laughs> like a bit of a bit of an issue, but that's uh, uh, the Western world for you. Um, so let's unpick what is a climate risk, actually. So because a lot of people say, well, flooding is a climate risk. Well, actually, flooding has always happened. We've always had floods. We always had storms. We always had these issues in New Zealand and everywhere. So why is it all of a sudden so important? Because it's getting more. Actually, when you look at the signs, it's slowly getting more. They're getting more frequent, <coughs> and they're getting more intense. But the key thing is actually us. Because the climate risk is when a hazard meets vulnerability and exposure. So let me give you an example. A hazard is a storm. Vulnerability is uh, uh, when we build timber houses. And exposure is when we build them in floodplains. And you think, well, who builds a house in floodplains? Well, a lot of us do. Even after, <laughs> even after the Auckland flood last year, there was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago, um, even in Auckland, the city council had to give consent to 1,400 new homes in floodplains in one year. And you think, why? Why would someone want to build that? Unfortunately, the current Resource Management Act doesn't give the council the tools to stop that, which is a pity. So they are now trying to find other ways to do that. Because you know what's going to happen. Those 1,400 houses at some point will be flooded. And what everyone does at the moment is one of the themes of my uh, little talk here is they turn to the local councillor and said, I want money. Buy, up, buy my house. And I want more than a rateable value, by the way, because it's the market value. And we can't go on like this. Now, let's jump across the ditch. Let's jump to Australia. And we go back 100 year time. So for those of you who are familiar with the landscape, you know in uh, the center of Australia, this huge big desert, uh, 100 years ago people used camels to transport stuff up and down the country. They started building a railway line, and back then you had steam engines, and those steam engines needed water. So they built the railway line along places where you could get water. There were some water, watering holes, which were great, because they were occasionally replenished by big floods. 
Now, of course, what happens is you have to build the railway line over those dry creeks that all of a sudden, within a day, we know that here in New Zealand, change into this massive flood. So they built the line in 20, 1929, one year later, the big bridge in Finke, halfway up the, close to the Yukna Data, uh, washed away. So they built a bigger bridge further up north. Of course, a few years later, that bridge washed away. And they kept doing this until in the 60s, the engineers said, this doesn't work. After their last bridge built of heavy concrete with many pillars sunk into the ground. So we need to change our tact. So what they did is they said, we're not going to rebuild this bridge. We are simply going to put our railway tracks through the riverbed. We know that it will wash away. But it's very easy to put those tracks back on the bed. It will take two weeks. Building a bridge cost a fortune and at least a year. So they changed the way they thought about infrastructure. Now let's jump across to the country that I hail from, the Netherlands. So as you all know, you've got pictures of Hans Brinker, little Hans Brinker, holding his finger in the dike, right? Because otherwise the country would flood. Now this, of course, is a myth that never happened. But you know the Dutch, basically what they did is you had like uh, areas around the coast that occasionally flooded. They built a dike around it, pumped the water out, put a few sheep and cow on there, uh, uh, and just cattle, let them graze. After a few years, a farm, more farms, a village, a town, a city. And now about 10, 15 million people live in those low-lying areas. And the whole system worked beautifully. That is, until climate change came along. Because the problem is not so much the fact that they managed to pump the water out. The problem is that there's a combination of rising sea levels, which makes it harder for the water that's coming from inland to leave the country. Because the sea level is higher than the uh, level of the river, so you can't discharge your water. So essentially, their beautiful system has transformed into a ginormous bathtub that when it really rains in Switzerland and Germany, it fills up. And the Dutch have said, we can't do this. We need a fail-safe way to deal with this. So instead of building higher dikes, costing a fortune, they said, we need to basically appropriate land from farmers that we can flood. And that's what they do. And, of course, people protest because people don't want to farm, farmers don't want to give their land back. But they know that for the sake of the community, that's the only viable way to keep your feet dry. They are also thinking about the future because they said in 30 years' time, if everything turns to custard, this will not fly. We will need something else. But they've got a lot of money, they've got big brains, so I'm sure they work out something. But the fact that they are starting the conversation is a good thing. Now, go back to New Zealand. An example from last year, French Pass in uh, Marlborough Sounds. There was a road going to uh, a few batches and houses. A few locals live there, a few people who just own batches there. That road was washed away in 21 and in 22 by storms and flooding. Now, the people who live there, I think it's 10, 15 people, 20, they want that road rebuilt. The council are saying, well, really? Because even if we can get Wakakotahi to pay half of it, which is like 130 million, and it sounds like free money, which it isn't, we'll get to that, then you'll still have to, as a ratepayer, all ratepayers in the entire region have to cough up $300 extra per year to pay for that road. And the question is, really? Do we want to spend 300 bucks on a road of 15 people, 10 of who actually don't live here, just so they can get there? The answer is probably not. And this is the challenge we've got. So in your, in your uh, constituency, you have like 10, 10, 10, 12 years ago, there was a report published in, in uh, Kapiti Paikakariki about uh, uh, flooding. And the rough estimate then was, back then was, 6,000 homes are potentially at risk of flooding. 6,000. Now, if I apply the, the, the calculation logic that the Ministry of Environment introduced last year, which is uh, if it's an owner-occupier, then we might have to basically built by those houses at maybe close to rateable value. Now, can you imagine 6,000 homes times rateable value? Who's going to pay for that? How many rate payers have you got? 30,000? In Kapiti? Yeah. Well, 30,000 people are not going to cover billions. They don't have the money. And the thing is, we are so used these days to say, well, government, help me. And the answer is, the government can't. The government cannot endlessly print money doesn't matter what government it is. They simply cannot afford to do this. Because we are talking just Kapiti. We're just talking French past 15 homes. And there's plenty of examples around the coast. So what we need is we need a different approach to this. We really need to learn to actually relearn to collaborate. 
we need to work with each other, with private sector, public sector communities. And there's a lot of money spent on research. Interestingly, uh, you know, research kind of reveals that this land is prone to flooding. I'm not sure if those of you who, who still uh, remember the uh, Christchurch quake, when a year after the quake, they did aerial survey with expensive equipment of the land that was red zoned, and they said, we shouldn't have built here. The Maori Kamatua said, we told you so. We said there was a Tanifa there, don't build there, but you never listened. So if we want to successfully tackle this, we need to go back. We need to listen, go back to Te Ao Maori and listen to them. They've got a concept that in my world of infrastructure doesn't feature very often. It's called cultural infrastructure. And as if, when you think about it, that's a, an amazing concept because it thinks about, it actually describes your link to a certain area. So you can dry up in a big office in Wellington and say, we're going to kind of move people from here and we're going to buy those people, we're not going to buy those people. You can't deal with it that way. People will revolt. They will act. They, they don't want that. So we need, to be, we need to use the time we have, which is not a lot, to actually start those conversations and together say, what can we do about this? How are we going to find our way out of this? And the answer is not the government is going to pay, because the government doesn't have that money, and neither do we. Just picking up on something that we, we talked about before, which is that um, we can't afford to have two disasters at once. Uh, all our disasters have been relatively consecutive and have been dealt with in turn. Could you just tell, tell us a bit more about why we can't have two at the same time? <laughs> I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> I, think, I think at some point we will have two disasters at the same time. So when you look at the Auckland flooding, the Auckland flooding was immediately followed by the Cyclone Gabriel. And Cyclone Gabriel, the focus of that was obviously in uh, Hawke's Bay and Tetaraviti because that's where m most people lost power. But in Northland was also heavily affected by that cyclone. And they, were just, they had just been hammered by uh, the rain that hit Auckland. And you will see that in the northern part of, of uh, North Island, they will get more and more of these things happening in quick succession. And if they are in parallel, the thing that would scare me the most is if you've got this major storm, su uh, storm surge happening, and then there's a major quake. And then, and then we are basically at a loss because uh, all the people we normally have in this country to deal with emergencies, are, they're all tied up. Now, they are backup teams. So you can hope that the backup teams will kick in quickly and deal with that. But again, it's just we are just limited for resources. We are at the southern corner of the South Pacific, and uh, at, the, at the, like the tiny corner of the South Pacific, and that makes it hard for us to kind of uh, uh, immediately get help here. And I think that's where we are exposed. And again, we need to work together with others. Not a lot of people of you might know this, but during the Christchurch quake on the first or the second week after the February quake happened, a guy knocked on the door of the cordon and said, hi, I'm from Toll Logistics. I know a bit about importing things in this country. Can I help you? That guy was instrumental to delivering uh, uh, port and equipment to New Zealand because he knew how to get them past MPI's rules. <laughs> and he knew how to <coughs> charter a ship and to get them here cheap. Now, that type of knowledge is not typically knowledge that's available to councils or to the government. Just by sheer luck, that man uh, knocked on the door. That was a great thing. The question is, how can you, and that's actually the conversations that we are having with the uh, 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 National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, about how do you grow a group of people around the country that you can rely on when something like this happened. It's all about who knows who, uh, who uh, knowing who, who you need to call. And we are a small country. That's a good thing. It's an advantage for us. But it's still a challenge, Philip. Thanks, Rutger. Um, on to Rod. Rod Oram's a specialist writer on climate. He's been regularly attending the, the big global summits each year, the COP meetings, uh, most recently in the Middle East. Rod, can you give us something of, that, of the bigger picture? I know you want to get into a societal picture, but also global responses, global risks. Uh, thank you, Kia Tato, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, here in Wellington and seeing some familiar faces and some old friends in the room. I'm afraid I'm very rarely in Wellington, so I very much appreciate your invitation, Philip. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's a magnificent day. Thank you. <laughs> um, just very briefly, um, 
the crucial thing about COP is to uh, be very clear in your own mind about what it is and what it does. So um, as the conference of the parties, that is all but about three countries in the world that have signed up to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, uh, every decision that COP makes has to be unanimous because since the beginning of COP, Saudi Arabia, amongst others, have refused to talk about um, how decisions might be made. Uh, could you, for example, agree something with a supermajority? Um, and so thus everything has to be agreed by every country. So thus COP is not the place where you would get fantastically big breakthroughs. Clearly in 20, um, the Paris Agreement uh, was one. Um, but it is a really important place where you get this extraordinary hui of humanity coming together every year. Um, people from government and more widely in politics, uh, people from civil society, from NGOs, from businesses, um, from faith groups, for example. Um, and there is a, a, a very intense couple of weeks of negotiation and discussions and presentations and all the rest. Um, and out of that, there is some agreement, um, and that framework then keeps building up. And once something is agreed in that framework, you then typically get a work program involved in that to develop those ideas and to disseminate that knowledge. So COP, I think, is fundamentally important to give an architecture, a structure, um, for these very complicated issues. Um, it is also, of course, a place where um, there is a big push um, in the annual cycle, culminating in COP itself, um, to try to make some really big progress. So um, this most recent COP in Dubai, COP um, 28, uh, was extraordinary because there was some language there on fossil fuels, and that was only the third COP um, Glasgow, where there was fossil fuel language, Glasgow in 2021 was the first time, COP26, um, that fossil fuels were actually in the final agreement, the cover document as it's um, known as. And the language um, in Dubai, of course, wasn't anywhere near enough the ambition we have to have um, because the, the such words as phase out, phase down weren't there. But there was language about a very fast transition away from all fossil fuels. And I think the, the most interesting word for me in there was grouping um, producers with consumers. So yes, we have to keep putting a lot of pressure on the producers, but we need to put a lot of um, pressure on we consumers um, about that fast phase out. Um, it gets more complicated because next year, sorry, this year, um, COP29 is in uh, Baku, capital of Azerbaijan, which is the oldest oil state in the world, dating back to the late 19th century, when they used to, used to barrel up uh, oil bubbling out of the ground, very light crude oil, uh, which people were then using for lamps and all the rest. So a uh, very long fossil fuel history there. Um, but um, with all due respect to Azerbaijan, they have none of the diplomatic resource that the UAE has. And the UAE did actually get um, score uh, very well on uh, the diplomatic effort it put into preparing for COP28. Um, and Azerbaijan will, uh, is, will really struggle with that, even with a lot of help from other countries. Um, and also an, another weakness is that um, they are um, uh, good friends with Russia um, and therefore um, somewhat influenced by them. So it's, it remains to be seen quite what a president there will be. But even though the location and, and thus the presidency matters a very great deal, um, there is still many ways in which um, big efforts, big voices, um, intense negotiations can push things on. So for me, the great uh, privilege, the great excitement of being at COP is that who we of humanity sense, because you never know quite who you're going to run into. Um, um, in my case, for example, um, in Dubai, 
um, I was just walking down one of the main thoroughfares one day and I could see an, an energetic group of uh, young, I guess they were North Americans, and indeed they were um, uh, American and Canadians, and they turned out to be evangelicals, um, having a very intense conversation with a man who turned out to be the head of administration for OPEC. They had been at a youth meeting that OPEC had called, and they were very dissatisfied with the responses they would got. And so they had sort of hijacked this person when they spotted him out of the OPEC uh, pavilion shortly afterwards. So I joined the conversation, and I must admit I quickly ditched my journalistic whatever and just dive straight into the discussion too. So that's the sort of extraordinary um, event that happens um, and is a very rich experience. Um, in due course, um, the year after is going to be in Brazil, um, but there's quite a big push for um, Australia um, to host the one thereafter. And the way it's chosen is the UN is divided into six geographic regions, and so the, each of the regions takes its in turn to host it. Uh, or a country in that region. So it, it swings back to us um, uh, in a couple of COPs time. Um, but the long and the short of it is, I think COP, for all the theatre, the drama, um, and everything else, is a very valuable thing to happen. And it's not just the climate COP. So for example, um, the COP on biodiversity, uh, which culminated in a big new agreement in Montreal last year, um, is also very worthwhile. Um, so it is laborious, um, but I think it's important to have that sense of uh, sort of common purpose that um, eventually um, COPs do achieve. You've got some thoughts too about um, communicating and dealing with climate on uh, as a society. Do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about um, that? The climate risk that worries me ever more intensely is actually the societal one. Because if as societies we can't cope with this, then everything gets worse. Uh, the climate itself, ecosystem health, um, it goes on and on. Then economics and um, so human well-being and welfare and the nature of society. So um, societies are by and large failing to address climate. Even the places that one would admire or does admire which would be, for example, most but not quite all of the Scandinavian countries and you know other parts of Europe um, are still really struggling to achieve um, the speed of scale, um, the, the sorry, the speed of change, the scale of change, and the complexity of change that's required. Um, so basically, humanity has to do that speed, um, complexity, and scale of change that has never come within CUI of before. So we we broadly know what we need to do, and we broadly know what um, new things we need to pursue to be able to deliver. Um, but we've got to do everything, everywhere, all at once, to borrow from a film title. Um, and and societies are completely failing to do that. Um, one could hope that a small country, hence we get some examples in the Scandinavian countries, um, are better equipped to do that, and thus New Zealand should play its role in that. So if you look, for example, at the um, Democracy Index, the, the Economist Intelligence Unit puts together every year, um, in the top 10 countries are, by and large, with the exception of Canada and Australia, um, f f small countries fill up that top 10. And, and we're right up there as well. But what we're seeing, even in small countries, is a breakdown in society's ability to discuss issues, actually even to agree on a simple set of facts, um, from which you then might come to a decision. Um, and this has obviously got worse around the world um, because of COVID me uh, and because of social media and all these other um, um, dysfunctions that we're uh, very, very uh, familiar with. Um, and uh, we're getting worse in New Zealand. So we're seeing with a change of government, we've managed to hold on to some very key parts of that architecture that 
um, James Shaw was very responsible for. Um, but um, we see across so many areas of policy um, decisions that are, have been, um, you know, we've made some progress on, but the new government uh, has already biffed or is planning to. Um, so we seem to have this default setting that every time there's a change of government, um, m lots of things are at risk. So we can't even get continuity, um, let alone um, build on this. And um, even in, in terms of um, people trying to get together or agree things, I, I, um, just the negotiations between the three parties that have created the current government, um, th there's real disparity and, and, and um, nothing robust or um, fail safe or foolproof um, in that coalition agreement, which is going to m make this a particularly functioning coalition government. That's not to go, and uh, not an argument, of course, for going back to first past the post, um, but it, it's, a, it's about trying to do coalition governments in ways that um, you do bring parties together on, on a, um, a more coherent and um, more secure um, program uh, across the coalition partners. Um, I have some thoughts about how generally society um, might try and make some <laughs> progress on this, oh, uh, and th this is in no particular order, and I would certainly need over time to come up with some much bigger ideas than these. But I'm always fascinated by social groups where there is a common interest. Um, it could be Rotary, it could be the golf club, it could be a parish church, it could be a book club, um, where there is a shared interest, um, but when you start to talk a bit about um, underlying differences between people on issues such as climate or the treaty or you name it, um, there would be quite a range. Um, but I think that um, one of our weaknesses in New Zealand, we are too keen um, to avoid those discussions and we sort of sweep them under the carpet. And um, I, in my experience now of almost 27 years as a New Zealander, we're very good at sweeping stuff under the carpet until it festers and then um, is immensely damaging. So maybe uh, one place is to start um, informally encouraging each other um, in situations where we have a common shared interest. Um, I'm a member of a Saturday coffee ride group, which is a amazingly different views. And when it gets edgy, we can always just talk about bikes, <laughs> which is very reassuring. Um, and um, so that's one thing. Um, another one um, would be um, some wonderful new ways of bringing people together, and one I would identify as the Climate Club. Um, a trio of young women um, have a tremendous um, Substack website, um, uh, email uh, group um, uh, that have just done their hundredth um, sort of newsletter last week. Um, and, and they are very, very astute uh, in, and very practical and encouraging. If you got five minutes this week, this is what you could do. If you got 15 minutes this week, this is what you could do. Um, and I think that um, organizations like that, which is a new style of bringing people together, um, and then there, of course, it, it has a great benefit. But then, of course, um, the one I'm, it's been running longer and I'm very fond of is Action Station, for example. Um, and um, I, I think that organizations like that can lead the way and then hopefully um, we could see some sort of revival in um, um, public membership of political parties so they become a bit like they were some decades ago, uh, far a bit more diverse, a bit more engaged in issues other than just trying to figure out who the next candidate might be and the narrow calculations about how they might get back into power. Um, and so between um, periods in government, parties in opposition can actually do some thinking um, rather than just coming back into power and just uh, recycling the stuff they'd done before that the, 
they that got turned over when they went into opposition, and they just bring back. I mean, you know, you know, the 90-day trial period, for example, would be a fantastically good example of that. Treasury and lots of people in business say actually it's not a great idea. It's not very effective, but it's back. Um, so we need uh, political parties in opposition um, that have that time and hopefully the ambition um, to think more deeply, start socializing new ideas, uh, not only amongst their own hopefully now larger memberships, um, if we got a, re a rebuild of political culture in the country, um, but with the public at large. Um, so that um, we could have campaigns based on some real decisions, some real ambition, um, and a, a change of government um, that could take over the burden from a tired bunch of people and be full of good ideas and energy um, into the future. So that's all wildly um, romantic and uh, optimistic, but that's about as far as I've got so far <laughs> in trying to work out how to do this. Thanks, Rod. And just while we're on this issue, as a journalist, how do you how do you write climate stories that engage with readers? Because we know lots of people don't want to read doom and gloom. Um, what are the issues around the way you write a climate story? And then Sophie, I'll come and talk to you about how councils communicate too. I figured out a long time ago, actually even before I, I, I just look, it, it, Try to explain. I'm I've, I'm still very involved across all of the economy. It's just that I'm entirely focused on how do 10 billion people live on this planet by 2050. To me, that's as an economic story. It's a business story. It's everything else. Um, so that's the lens. But I'm still deeply involved a across all of that. But I decided a long time ago um, that I can't change anybody's mind about anything. And my function is only um, to encourage people who think the same way I do. <laughs> um, so that, that's, that's, I think, the, the maximum I can do. Um, I do occasionally uh, rather relish, th for example, taking Matthew Hooten apart <laughs> line by line when he writes things that are just so completely off the wall. Um, and, um, and I do the same with some other people too. Um, and just try to knock every falsehood back into, well, anyway, whatever. Um, I, I must admit I probably enjoy doing that rather more than I should enjoy doing it. Um, but I doubt that Hooten's ever written, read what I've written. I, I, d I think he would, wouldn't care less what I wrote. Um, so uh, it is really, really difficult. And, you know, to be... Um, completely honest, and I mean, I've started to say this, uh, I'm just finding it harder and harder um, to feel that um, that it's possible to be useful. And so, essentially, what I'm doing is s actually something I've always done as a journalist. I'm doing something incredibly selfish. I've had for many decades now this huge privilege to be a journalist, which means I spend a lot of my time, it's how I earn a living, thinking about this stuff. And, and quite honestly, I'm only, my first motivation is just try to make sense of it for myself. And I'm about to say something, I, I do take this phrase seriously, and I mean it quasi clinically. I think if I wasn't able to spend that time learning about things and trying to sort them out on my own mind, I think I'd go crazy, or at least very depressed, or more depressed than I sometimes am. Um, and so I have this huge privilege to, um, that's the job I do, that's the work I do, that's how I earn an income. Um, and so I will keep doing it because I love doing it, um, but it's, to be quite honest, what I'm doing is essentially very selfish. I'm. J I'm actually doing it for myself, but if it's useful to other people, then I'm very happy about that. Thanks, Rod. So um, we might come back to that. Sophie, how does, a, how does a council communicate with people, given all the fears, given all the brouhaha around climate change? I think it's something that we have to probably acknowledge we could all be doing a lot better at. I think that's probably a place to start, is that so often 
um, councils don't like being criticised or challenged and some, sometimes can get quite defensive. So I think it's, it's probably a, a, yeah, a, a place where we can acknowledge that specifically our council and I'm sure those across New Zealand um, could be thinking about different ways to engage different parts of our community so we're not always just hearing from the same people. Um, for example, how we enfranchise young people through our communications, how we ensure that um, iwi Māori can lead sort of their own comms supported by the council to connect in um, their own part of the community into the conversation. So I think it's something where um, sort of devolving some power is really important. And again, I don't think that's something that councils are particularly used to doing. So it um, potentially makes some people feel quite uncomfortable, the thought of that, the, th the thought of sharing, um, the thought of creating space and passing the mic. But I think that that's something that councils um, could get a lot better at doing. Um, I think also councils' communication has to be relevant. I think um, there's often and we find this with even just the way, ways in which our agendas are written, um, the ways in which you know, meetings are held. It's, it's often just quite sophisticated, intimidating, technical, bureaucratic. Um, and for a lot of people, it's just not relevant. They just want to know, you know, they want to know things about the, the footpaths they're walking on, the cycleways that they're riding on the water that they're getting from their tap, the way in which the stormwater will deal to um, flood water or stormwater that finds itself you know, in, in our community. So I think we have to get better at finding ways to communicate that's relevant and connects directly to the way in which our communities use the infrastructure um, instead of you know, 600 odd pages of reports um, that frankly we can't expect people to have the time to read um, or yeah, let alone to read but then to understand um, the implications of that on, on them uh, and on their whānau. I think another thing that councils are kind of getting better at doing but, but could continue to improve on and our council's been sort of delving into this is how we visually communicate, how we depict you know, how our community could look or maybe should look into the future. Um, if we make this decision around intensification, what does that practi practically look like in terms of where houses will be and, and how people will get around, um, how you'll be able to access the services that you need just to make sure we're alleviating that concern that can come with change, um, that there might be something that we're hiding or there's a hidden agenda and with this kind of rise in misinformation um, that's something that we're, we're acutely aware of and is, is very, um, yeah, we, we have to be aware of because it's alive and well um, I think in New Zealand and in the world uh, at, at large. So visually sort of depicting and, and even using tools like AI, there's some really awesome examples up in Auckland where um, I think it was th maybe through their long-term plan consultation where you could sort of navigate around on a cell phone around the, the streets of Auckland and sort of plug in um, using the application what you would like to see in those different parts of the city and then it would sort of virtually simulate those things, place them there and you could see what they'd look like um, in practice pretty much playing out in front of you, um, newly built infrastructure, a new bench seat, a water fountain, another tree, a ngā, urban ngahere, some, some marakai, some food gardens, so those sorts of tools, I think, um, to, to help alleviate some of the fear that, that comes with change, to allow people to see the real positives that can come from climate action and those co-benefits. I think um, Rod talking about you know, the, the intersections of the, the many crises that we are facing and how we sort of look to navigate all of those things at once. I think we can also look at that from kind of a potentially a hopeful angle which suggests that if we look at the climate crisis intersectionally there are so many ways in which we can reduce other injustices, inequities um, by rebalancing our relationship with the planet and by allowing our community and creating space for our community to imagine uh, what's possible and to look at, uh, yeah, to look at kind of all of the hope that that could bring and I think artificial intelligence and technology has the potential to aid us uh, in that pursuit. I don't know yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's all figured out yet, but I think there are some potential openings um, to that being possible. And the other thing that I think our council has, has started to get better at, but again, <laughs> acknowledging that we don't by any means have all the answers and are continuing to work at this, is how we empower and resource community champions to communicate. So council is not 
going to be the one voice that everyone wants to listen to or feels like um, feels like they respect. But if we can equip people in our community and, and, and allow them to feel ownership over the decisions that we're making as representatives of our community, but also create pathways for them to lead, um, that that is also extremely beneficial, not only for us as a council, but also for um, for their peers, for their neighbours, for the people in their you know bike groups, for the people in their book clubs, for the people in their rotary clubs as well. So I think that's um, quite important. We've got an example of that at the moment. My colleague and I have started the Our Vision for Romati project. So we've brought on board several community champions who are facilitating workshops locally to sort of bring together a whole bunch of different ideas and essentially depict that into a bit of a roadmap um, for, for the future of Blueprint as to how these ideas could interplay with each other and, and therefore what sort of community spirit, community vibe, community feel and community look uh, we could have for Romati. So we're encouraging our community to lead that conversation um, with, with obviously having us there to support it and resource it. But I think, yeah, communications is a really crucial part of this puzzle and I don't think it's sort of talked about enough. Just, just briefly, um, what we found with the school strike for climate and sort of bringing so many people out into the streets was that the simplicity of the messaging was what counted. We, we were often asked, you know, what are your demands? What's your manifesto? You know, note down all your policy platforms for, for what you're bringing people together for. And the media obviously loves that sort of stuff. And, and it's important for us to get that on the table because it was why we were mobilising the people and what we wanted the government to do off the back of that. But actually what got all those people out on the streets was not the fact that we were standing together for an ambitious and cross and, and, and a, an ambitious zero carbon act with cross party support. It wasn't that we were standing up for Parliament to make a declaration of a climate emergency. It wasn't that we were standing up for resilient infrastructure in the face of a changing climate. It was the fact that we have an obligation to future generations to do everything that we can right now, and we we don't want them to inherit a mess of a planet. And if we don't stand up for climate justice now you know, what, what, will the, what will the future generations really have? And it's that messaging being put so simply that we found reached people and it connected with people. Uh, and April the 5th is a date to put in all of your diaries. It's going to be another um, mass mobilisation. We just had a call last night with over 25 different organisations, including multiple unions, uh, teachers, Te Waka Haurua, an awesome Indigenous Ropu, uh, the group from Toy to Tititi who are standing under the umbrella of climate justice to support this kaupapa as well. So we're very much committed to, to continuing to build that momentum because I think as much as our leaders really need to feel it and they need to know that they have a social mandate to at least hold the line on climate, I think actually we need it as people and as a community to feel a part of something that's striving for positive change for our mukapuna because otherwise I think these next three years are just going to be really really hard so 5th of April um, would love to see all of you there intergenerationally it's so important us as rangatahi are really happy to help pull it together um, but we really really want and need as many of you as possible to, to stand in alongside um, so yeah stay tuned for more information coming out through media and um, on the school strike for climate social media Thanks, Sophie. Uh, Rutka, the, a lot of our infrastructure organisations are set up to compete with each other. Electricity companies compete, telecommunication companies compete, but yet the, the climate issues require collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about those, those two different forces? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Philip. I think that, that is a, that is a, a very valid question. Uh, so if you go back to last year, Cyclone Gabriel, um, we saw that um, there was, I think, four or five different telecom companies involved because there's uh, people uh, like Spark, but also the people who kind of run the lines, people who fix the lines. They were all seamlessly working together to restore uh, uh, the uh, telecommunications infrastructure. So they basically got people in a room that said, this is my bit, I can do that bit. If you do that bit and we string that together, then we can have a line up and running back to Hawke's Bay. So there was seamless co uh, communication. The only th you didn't read that in about that in the media a lot, but it really worked. Same with the electricity companies. So you see the local company, Unison, Transpower New Zealand, 
uh, and lines companies who f repair lines, they were all seamlessly working together to make things happen. And the local people actually helped out by s they started to clear pieces of infrastructure even before the companies got involved. Because they said, you know, I'm a farmer, I've got a digger. I've, c I've, got, I've lost my harvest for the year, so I might as well make myself useful. So I've basically dug a path for you through the silt. So that is a typical example of like uh, New Zealand resilience, where you see local stepping in and doing these things. In terms of the collaboration, you see that too. When push comes to shove, there is collaboration. What is very hard to do, though, is when you say, okay, now let's, let's cast the net out wide and say, well, can we then think about a structure going forward? How do we kind of, because this is all kind of very ad hoc, so how do you kind of um, well, codify how, how this? Do we, how do we have a grid that's resilient? How do you, how do you codify it? Or? And how do, you, how do you ensure that you can keep doing this going forward? And there's conversations, uh, uh, always conversations happening about that also, um, supported by, uh, by government, by uh, National Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet who are really keen for sectors to collaborate. And if you look how things are run in, for instance, the United States, where they've learned a lot since uh, they had a few major mishaps with uh, cyclones like uh, Hurricane Katrina that was absolutely mismanaged by the government. It was a total uh, uh, disaster. But they've taken the learnings from that and they've now set up like systems and processes where people are encouraged to work together. And you see now that that's going a lot better. And, uh, but it's not something you, you can do and then say, great, I'm done, I'm, 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 I can rest on my laurels. You have to continuously test uh, uh, that, that and kind of and dial it up a notch. Only then you can cope with what's coming our way. Sorry, Rob. Uh, uh, thank you. If I um, may add to that by talking about the electricity sector, because this is, for me, one of the most exquisite issues. Um, the electri our electricity sector, similar to around the world is still very much focused in an early 20th century model, a century old model, of having large scale generation, transmitting electricity long distances, uh, and, and then reticulating it. So it's a very one way system uh, and very heavy on infrastructure. Um, but that's not where technology is going with electricity. It's about um, local um, generation and storage and trading. Um, and distribution um, because of photovoltaics on roofs and the like. Um, and um, the, what's happening is that the gen tailors uh, want to progress, but they want to progress in a way that protects their existing asset base as long as possible because shareholders want you know, a nice share price and good profits. And um, they're only moving as fast as, uh, as their model will allow them to do. Um, and they're holding back the shift to uh, a 21st century two-way grid, which is very local, which would be wonderfully resilient. Um, and fortunately, there are some disruptive players in there. So um, what was Solar City had, had been around for a long time, putting photovoltaics on people's houses. Um, I was a customer 10 years ago, um, got bought by BlackRock, um, and you can have lots of concern about BlackRock, but still they are uh, big investors, um, and they are now able to move far faster because they have access to capital to do that. Um, and uh, they are already in the market as a virtual um, reserve power uh, source um, because of all the battery storage um, in their network of homes. But the roadblock continues to be the electricity authority as the regulator, um, uh, which is far too beholden to the gen tailors and that 20th century model. Um, and and uh, there is not anywhere enough political awareness or ambition to, te to give the electricity authority, to in insist on the electricity authority and um, moving things along far faster. So that's why we've got an electricity problem and an infrastructure weakness in electricity. Um, it isn't going to be solved by TY point uh, stopping, smelting, and thus, woohoo, all this ele electricity we can bring all the way up from Manapuri to Auckland. Well, I don't think so. Um, so th um, we've got to have those political decisions that changes the regulatory uh, and business model, and then we could really get um, fantastic 
not only new generation capacity, but real resilience in the electricity system. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, so I'll come around with a microphone and uh, make sure they're questions and not comments, please. Just a very uh, quick, simple question. In terms of magnitude, and especially on a global le level, what's the carbon footprint of war? You know, there's a couple of wars. Uh, large. I, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, okay. I'm not going to cite any figures. Um, and it's really interesting because the. Um, Certainly some military uh, understand the issue and the Pentagon um, has actually got quite an interesting lot of work goes on in the US about how you fight wars um, in ways that you are can do so through climate and, and um, alternative fuel sources, for example. Um, but the long and short it is, um, it, war is a, a, a material contributor um, to greenhouse gases um, and of course that's only the fighting and then when all the rebuilding goes on um, we're still re rebuilding in concrete and steel for example so there's a huge footprint there um, from um, um, rebuilding uh, war-torn zones so yes big other questions yep a uh, question for you, Rod. Um, did you uh, did you detect at COP any support or any increased support for border tax adjustments or carbon tariffs, given that there is a bit of an ebb tide running on free trade and, and globalisation more broadly? And if so, do you see any risks for New Zealand if that uh, becomes more of a thing? Um, the EU has been remarkably staunch on sorry, I'm using, I just love the acronym CBAMs, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanisms. Um, and so they are pursuing it. Um, it's, this last couple of years has been really interesting because you've seen a different kind of response from the US, which is Biden's view about trying to uh, make sure that a lot more climate-related technology is, is developed and produced in the United States, hence the uh, wonderfully named Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and uh, But again, there's a lot of political pushback on that. It would only become a problem for New Zealand if the EU made more progress on agriculture um, and therefore the climate footprint of European farmers um, improved dramatically. Um, and you can see where there is real problems in Europe. So the Irish farmers are very unhappy because it looks as though they might have to reduce their herds a bit. Um, the Dutch farmers are up in uproar because their nitrate levels are so high. The country is in serious ecological crisis. Um, and um, the way the Dutch government's responding to that is trying to well, buy them out from farming um, to reduce that nitrate load. But these farmers are saying, this is uh, this is how I define myself. You know, th this is what I want to do. I want to keep farming. Um, and then in uh, Germany, in late recent weeks, uh, we've had a government trying to um, pull back on some of the um, subsidies for diesel fuel. And then you know, we've got you know combine harvesters and tractors motoring up to uh, Berlin. Um, so. Um, I think the EU will continue to make progress on that, um, but until the, a bigger gap uh, opens up between what's actually happening on the ground with changing farming practices in Europe versus here, um, I think we can be relatively all right. But not the least of which is um, that as our um, dairy and red meat producers love to point out, um, that pasture-fed animals have a, a lower um, greenhouse gas footprint per kilogram of milk solids or meat. Um, um, so that's a, a, also a good buffer. However, um, so one last point about that is that the huge problem that our farmers have, 
I have is that they believe that that's all by and large all they need to do. They just need to tune up their existing farming practices and it's up to the rest of the world to catch up with them. The, there is very little discussion here of the global picture that land use change, farming and food production and then downstream from food is in aggregate the largest single source of greenhouse gases. It's more than from, you know, f fossil fuels for energy and transport. Um, and it's not only the carbon footprint, but it's all the damage to ecosystems as well. So what is starting to happen are these very, very uh, b big rethink about what land use change farming and food looks like. And, and so our farmers, if they don't lock on to that sooner rather than later, um, they're going to become irrelevant um, and um, will f we'll suffer from increased consumer rejection, f um, which might go all the way at some point to um, uh, much greater resistance to the farming of animals, for example. Um, from a, 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 a humane point of view, let alone the, the um, e ecological footprint of the animals, which is huge. Um, so, um, yeah, our farmers have basically got to start thinking about that big global picture. Good morning, my name's Dolph. Um, Rutger, the, the comments about social adjustment and that you know it's not only the producer it's also the consumer that it, it overlaps all three of your your comments uh, how, how, how do you see that as as being able to be developed because it is the thing that we are sadly lacking oh, oh, thank you that's a, that's there's a question with a lot of dimensions actually I think I think one of the things that um, I find is that uh, people's concept of time gets in the way. So when do people get fired up when they see their street flooded? But when the street's fine, that goes away. Why are people so worried about Wellington's water leaks at the moment? Because there's water everywhere. Not because there's old and aging pipes behind the ground, uh, under the ground, but that has been like that for decades. But only because now you see water and occasionally your street collapses and then water and then cars get blown blown un under under all kind of debris. That's when people say, well, hang on a sec, this is actually, now it's getting urgent, council do something. It's the same council that uh, was actually forced to not invest money because that's those same people wanted something else. The, the problem that we have is that we have a very short horizon. I stayed at a b and in Mangavayets years ago and uh, the, um, guy who owned uh, it, he was actually an investment banker and had a fascinating conversation with him one evening. He said, you know, New Zealand is essentially a big farm and that is a really good thing because we stand, or we really connect to the land. That's something that a lot of countries around the world have lost. For instance, the Dutch, the way they kind of uh, get their cows to produce a lot of milk is by actually taking them off the land, put them in a shed and feed them all sorts of stuff. That creates all the pollution which is now catching up with them. Um, but if you look to us, we still farming, but it also means that our time horizons are short. Our election cycle is three years. Uh, when you talk to people about what's, what's their main worry is, you hear about what's worrying and what's actually a concern for them for the next week. But getting people to think about a strategic view, strategic plan, think about we need to invest now so that by then our mokapuna will have a better life. You say, yeah, that's a great thing to say, but can I please continue doing what I'm always done because I'm used to it and I don't want to give up on anything. And it's actually getting that message across by, uh, I like the idea that uh, Sophia kind of just kind of uh, f f actually shared about the fact that you walk around and you see what's happening. So maybe we just need to uh, look for social media or, or, or modern technology to make people more aware of that. That, that whatever they do uh, might not be here going forward. People were really taken years ago by... Um, I think it was on was on TV. It was a uh, 15 years ago about an earthquake in Wellington. You could see what would have, what the devastation it was all in scene, of course. But people thought, well, hey, far out. I need to go to the store tomorrow and buy some spare water jugs, <laughs> and that's what happened. So people do act, but only when they see it right in front of their eyes. If it's not there, they won't see it. So it's the role of the government, of companies, of community centres to make that visible. 
this is, this is our future. And you have an option, you have a choice. We always have a choice. These are your choices, where do you want to go? If I, if I may just add a thought about time horizons and everything else, I, I think one of the things we're completely failing to do is to persuade people or, or show people um, how pleasant a life is when you do some of this stuff, right? And, and, and that's even just um, a better life now, um, even not taking into account hopefully a more moderate climate change than we might otherwise have. And just to persuade people or, or to encourage people to do stuff because, I mean, for example, uh, over recent years, uh, my wife and I, our diet's far more diverse and much more interesting than it used to be. Um, and um, we had turned an 80-year-old house in, in Auckland into a net zero energy house. Um, uh, and it was uh, warmer, drier, better lit, m much pleasanter house, even nicer than it was already. Um, and um, and yet, when we came to sell it um, uh, a year ago to move into an apartment, um, we c we couldn't really int people actually weren't interested in that. And I, I'd, I put out a little two-sided A4 description of what we'd done to the house and how much cheaper it was to run and how pleasant it was to live in. Um, um, you know, even in winter, it, most it cost about a dollar and a half a day to heat. Um, and people just weren't interested. So how on earth we get, let alone pay something over the odds for all those wonderful achievements. So trying to persuade people, or, or just not persuade, just make people aware of how much better your life is once you've changed some things in your life for the better. Sophie, do you want to perhaps wrap up and talk about that a little bit, about the communication, the student rally coming up, how we reach a sort of tipping point in people's consciousness? Big question. Yeah, just just to wrap up. Um, yeah, massive, massive question. I think, yeah, that's that's a great point around the choice that we have right now. And I think the other thing that we've we've found that's really reached a lot of the people who have come on board and are, are hoping to make this April fifth sort of movement and momentum um, the largest, even even bigger than twenty nineteen. So more than three point five percent of New Zealand's entire population is the fact that we happen to be alive in this window of time. And how incredible is that, that all of us have found ourselves both being in this room but also being on this planet when so much hangs in the balance. And yes, we always have a choice, but right now that choice is so stark. It's never been sort of more, more almost disparate, those two potential horizons that we could, um, we could either, we could choose between. Uh, and so I think making that really clear that actually being alive right now has a, it comes with it a massive responsibility and that's not something that we should, we should take lightly and we should think about how we sort of transfer into our everyday lives and as Rod's talked about some of those real co-benefits that come from living a, a zero carbon life and celebrating that, like let's talk about those wins, let's feel proud of the fact that we you know, eating less meat or the fact that we're cycling. I personally don't have my driver's license. I've got an e-bike and it gets me around perfectly well. And sometimes my friends are like, oh, get your license and you can go on road trips. You'll have your independence. And I'm, and I actually, I'm perfectly happy and, and probably more so because I can get out on my bike. I can be amongst nature. It's a 30 minute ride to work. And I'm just trying to get better at feeling really proud of that and standing in my own conviction, knowing that I'm living the life that I'd feel proud of. And, ho and hopefully other people will see that and do the same, but it can feel like we're sort of outliers in a bigger system that's lagging behind. But I think that's even more of a reason for us to make decisions that we know are morally right and stand in that and just keep on sort of celebrating and sharing that with other people. Uh, and then slowly, I, I hope, and I, I do think that that will sort of cotton on. Um, I also think that we, we can't afford to not be hopeful. And I know it's kind of, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely hard at this moment in time, but I, and I definitely go through waves for sure, but um, with, with being alive right now, I think comes that, that responsibility and that opportunity to see what's possible and to, as, as Rod's talked about too, to do everything that we can for ourselves, um, but also for our communities to make sense of what's going on. 
um, but then also to um, to contribute to a better world. So, um, yeah, that that does come with huge opportunity and huge responsibility. But I think yeah, we've got to got to be a little bit hopeful, um, so that we can we can sort of not just be paralysed by a sense of fear and and overwhelm at the scale, which is very easy to do, especially with social media, um, sometimes and and sort of the news cycles that keep the crisis and and what it looks like for people's lives right now very much front of mind. Um, but let that be something that inspires us to be resilient um, and not to despair. Like when we look at, for example, the Pacific Climate Warriors, which are a growing movement in New Zealand, they are often sort of patted on the back and said, oh, you know, it must be, it must be hard, you know, seeing your islands go under um, or seeing your cultures be at threat, seeing your homelands, the water lapping and, and you know, there's not that much that, that can be done. Um, but it's like, well, what, what they say in response is, we're not drowning, we're fighting. We can't afford to drown. <laughs> We've got to keep fighting. Uh, and so let that not be a, a reason to despair, but let that be something that continues to inspire us to be resilient uh, and, and to continue to stand up for what we know needs to happen. Yeah. Brilliant. Hey, thank you. Very good words. <laughs> That's a, a wonderful way to, to end this session. And can you join with me in thanking Sophie, uh, Rutger and Rod. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>